We heal as a team. We're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen. Believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back, way back, into the light. Into the light. Into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell. One inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're going to see a guy you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's the team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individuals individual, 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 individual. ideas are bulletproof Welcome all. It's Wednesday, May 25th, 2011. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. And today I'm joined by my good friend, Professor Jim Fetzer. Jim, say hello. Hey, Popeye. Glad to be back. And uh, I hear you're a little under the weather today. Yeah, you can probably tell from my voice. Yeah, I got some nasty cold, but I uh, didn't want it to stop being here today. And you see that that's a patriot. That's that that's a man right there. He's sick as a dog, and he still comes on my radio show at ten o'clock at night. So, you, people should listeners, you know, be thankful to Jim for you know fighting through this cold to come on the show. He didn't have to. I gave him the chance of bailing out, and he told me no. So, he he's definitely definitely a a, a real man. Um, the last time you were on the show, we were talking about a wide variety of things, and. In the the huge conversation we were having, you mentioned something about Iraq, and we didn't get a chance to get touch on it because four hours with you, Jim, is just not enough. I would need like a, you know two sixteen hour days of you just, to, just to get out all the info you have. <laughs> and you said something about the death of Saddam Hussein and his two sons yeah. and the whole mission accomplished thing. So, without wasting any more of the listeners' time, since we only have an hour during the week, uh, yeah. Go ahead and tell people the astonishing story that you told me. Well, it is an astonishing story, and I can't believe that the major media haven't picked up on this because the evidence supporting it is uh, from multiple directions, multiple sources, all converges on the story I'm going to tell you. And for those who uh, want to check it out, they can find all the evidence they want related to this. If they go to 911scholars.org, that's the home page for Scholars for 9-11 Truth, 911scholars.org, and scroll down to the section entitled The Mission Accomplished Fiasco. So it's right on the home page. You scroll down to The Mission Accomplished Fiasco. You're going to find transcripts of interviews I've given, copies of articles related to this, and a host of other in, in 
input. There must be, I don't know, a dozen or more articles and, and sources related to this. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. There are actually 17 items here, though I think there's at least uh, one duplication. Uh, but it's a fantastic story. And, and what happened was I was contacted by a woman who turns out to be the mother of a B-1 bomber pilot who served in Iraq. And she began to tell me a story about her son and how he received the coordinates for a high-priority mission. And uh, he executed his mission when he returned to base. He was lionized. He was put on CNN. He was eventually awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, he was feted at the Crystal Cathedral in uh, Orange County, California, uh, in Anaheim, I believe. And there's documentation for all of this here in the Mission Accomplished fiasco. What, what we're talking about is a B-1 bomber pilot. His name is Chris Wachter, W-A-C-H-T-E-R. His mother, Yvonne, Y-V-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Y-V-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, who, who explained to me that her son had taken out Saddam Hussein and his two sons and about 60 members of his general staff already on April 7, 2003, which was only 21 days after the incursion into Iran began on the 19th of March. And when she first contacted me and told me about this story, I said, this is quite fantastic. I said, but you need documentation. Well, she had had experience, among other things, as, a, as a, a law clerk. And she proved to be extremely good at research. And she started sending me stuff and more stuff and more stuff, even including Dick Cheney being quoted in an article saying that they pulled his lifeless body out of the rubble and he was confident he was dead. And this, of course, was very early on. And it was not long before the so-called Mission Accomplished event was to take place on the USS Lincoln off the coast of San Diego. And uh, what, what, what happened, apparently, is that someone figured out that this, this event, this, this taking out of Saddam and his two sons, actually was in violation of... Uh, executive orders signed by three presidents, uh, Gerald Ford, uh, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan, so that if, in fact, they were to go forward to have Bush announce the big event, namely that they'd taken out Saddam, they would actually be acknowledging that he'd committed a crime in relation to these executive orders. And therefore, and our best guess is that Donald Rumsfeld was the one who pieced this together. When Bush went on to the USS Lincoln, he wasn't able to talk about what had, was going to be the centerpiece. The mission accomplished was deposing Saddam. Now he was dead, but because of these executive orders, he wasn't able to talk about it. So this is really quite a stunning story. That what you have to understand... Did they figure this out last minute, Jim? Is that why it was such a, a, a cluster F you, yes. you know, regarding yes. that whole thing? Yeah, that's right. That, that's exactly right, Popeye. That they, 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 when they began planning it, they thought it was just going to be a joyous celebration. We'd taken out the head of this foreign state, etc. But that's what you couldn't do, given these executive orders. You're not allowed to assassinate the head of a foreign state. Now, to get a little background here, and, and Yvonne is just wonderful, so I've interviewed her and created transcripts so you can get the whole story. I mean, this two-hour interview, I think there are two of them. Not only did I interview her on my show, well, it was a dynamic duo. It may have been one hour, but it's a dandy. Then we were, the two of us, on Maria Heller's show, the, the Maria show. And then I had Yvonne back. So I had her first on the 11th of April, 2007. Uh, we were together on the Maria show on 3 September, 2007. 12 September, 2007, I had her back. So uh, then we have these phone interviews with Captain Chris Wachter. We have reports that Saddam Hussein may be dead or severely injured, Bush says. Now, that Captain Walker interview was on 8th of April, which was just the day after this, this all took place. 
So, so he was, as I say, lionized, given the distinguished flying cross. The way, the way it happened, the way it came to pass, is that Saddam had ordered these very high-tech Jaguar cell phones from the British. And, uh, oh, you know what, Jim, hold on. Hold on, we're it. going to break. No problem. It's just Guys, fine. stick around. Jim Fetzer's unlocking your mind one door at a time. He's hanging out with me for the next 45 minutes. Stay tuned. No, we're not going to take it, right, Jim? We're pissed yeah, off. Yeah. That's why we're here telling everybody what's going on. Because we're tired of sitting back and watching the evil New World Order destroy the planet and everything else yeah. and killing people. And that's why we do what we do. So you guys, really, I hope you appreciate everything we do because this is all done free of charge. None of us are getting a paycheck for this. It's not like Jim and I sit back and collect a, a six-figure income from any of this. Well, God, if you could arrange that, Popeye. Yeah, right? It, they would be nice. I mean, I wouldn't mind getting a paycheck for what I do, but I, I, we certainly don't yeah. do it. Um, well, believe, Jim, before yeah, we went to break, you were touching on something. Um, yeah, well, believe it or not, I mean, this story is even bigger than the second killing of Osama bin Laden, who actually died 15 de- December 2001. So he, he appears to have died from complications from his kidney disease, and he was uh, buried in an unmarked cemetery in the ground in accordance with Muslim practice. There and this has up- been Laden you're talking about, just in case yeah. anybody's not sure. This has been Laden, Jim, speaking. Yeah, about. I'm saying how here we got this one fraud, you know, of, of Osama allegedly being killed during this recent raid in Pakistan when the guy's actually been dead for nine years. And I say, but that was such a monster PR op, you know, and they had the stage photograph of the vice president, the president, secretary of state, all looking at this TV, and it was played up that they were watching live as this took place. And all of it turns out to be phony, fabricated, just fake. And there are, you know, so many indications that this is just untrue and staged for propaganda purposes. And I've been a, I was astonished afterwards at the huge amount of PR that was being given to this. It was practically on every channel. Uh, regular shows were being interrupted to bring up something more about uh, Osama. And, and it's all to try to reinforce the idea that 9-11 was a legit operation, which, of course, it wasn't. But the fact of the matter is that do, doing these kind of deceitful uh, acts, uh, pretending that Osama is still alive. I mean, we have one legitimate interview with Osama after 9-11, in which he denied having anything to do with 9-11. He said... It was contrary to the tenets of Islam to kill innocent women and children, and that there was a government within the government in the United States. And he, he was right on all of those counts, and that the government within the government was intent on blaming, you know, the, 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 the Muslims for these actions. We know many things about it. Elias Davidson, for example, has, has published an article showing the government has never been able to prove any of the alleged hijackers who were aboard any of the planes. David Ray Griffin has published a piece showing that all the phone calls from all four flights were faked. Uh, we have Colonel George Nelson observing that uh, for the first time, you know, not, not only did the NTSB not investigate any of these plane crashes, when it, where an FBI agent was asked why not, he said, well, it wasn't necessary because we saw them on television. And, of course, the one flight we actually did see on television in some detail was Flight 175 hitting the South Tower. And after years of being unwilling to look at it, I was finally induced to, to study what was going on and, and discovered that those who had been complaining something phony was there were right, that the plane is traveling at an impossible speed, that its entry into the South Tower is in violation of Newton's laws, that it's passing through its own length into the building in the same number of frames as passing through its own length in air, which would only be possible. And what Jim means is that something hit the towers but what you saw on TV, the contrived image, he's saying, and he, he's not, in, we're not even speculating that something didn't, you know, that uh, a, a vehicle of some sort laden with explosives didn't hit the towers because something obviously hit well, and blew up. But well, what Jim's saying yeah. is the video fakery that we saw on television that was, pub, you know, that was the only thing you saw over and over again. 
was these same convenient shots like you mentioned the the plane slipping into the building well, with that that one yeah. CNN reporter I forget his name <clears throat> the, the videographer he just happened to be in the right place at the right time well so let me just point out Popeye that if you're seeing impossible events in a film something's wrong exactly so something and, and we're had seeing to be... multiple impossible events in this case such as the plane entering completely into the building before you get these explosions. Uh, now, that, that plane entering the South Tower was intersecting with eight different floors, Popeye. And each of those floors was a steel truss that was connected to the core columns at one end and the external support columns on the other and filled with four to eight inches of concrete. And the, the, the depth varied because it had V's in, in, the, in the flooring where the concrete was four inches more than the shallower parts. But it was intersecting with Eight, eight of these. Each of them was a, a con, uh, an acre of concrete, 208 feet on a side. And I just say that would have created enormous horizontal resistance. Any, any plane that would have hit those eight floors intersected the way the, the, this one supposedly th did would have crumpled, its wings would have broken off, the engines would have passed into the building. But the, the nose would have been smashed up, uh, the tail would have broken off, you would have had body seats, luggage falling to the ground. None of that happened. So something's wrong there. Uh, John Lear, by the way, who's one of our nation's most distinguished pilots, has also observed that before a commercial carrier can pull away from a terminal, that the pilot has to submit an envelope, which includes a checklist for the fuel supply and all that flight plan, and usually a passenger manifest, or at the very least a number of passengers on board. And none of the envelopes for any of these flights has ever been submitted. But the key thing I'm making about this uh, Osama thing is the whole, all these events in 9-11, there's a tremendous amount about this if you go to 911scholars.org, right? It was, a, it was a, a, a faked operation. It was staged. It had all kinds of special effects, and there are lots of ways to prove that. If you go to 911scholars.org, just check on the upper left-hand corner, you'll find 20 major findings that refute the official account there. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link to PatriotsQuestion911.com, where you'll find thousands of professionals and experts across the disciplines, firefighters, law enforcement professors, engineers, architects, government officials, etc., who are offering their photographs, biosketches, and statements about disbelief regarding 9-11 and, and their concern about the failure to present the truth. Now... This idea of blaming this on Osama bin Laden, of course, was essential to the whole scheme because if you didn't have, as were the planes, because if you didn't have the planes, you wouldn't have the hijackers. If you didn't have the hijackers, you wouldn't have Arab terrorists. If you didn't have Arab terrorists, you wouldn't have Osama back in Afghanistan and a justification for invading Afghanistan and Iraq, which was in violation of international law, the U.N. Charter and even the U.S. Constitution. And George Bush had already signed the invasion order for <laughs> Afghanistan the day before September 11th. So yes. <laughs> unless he had precognitive vision and then didn't tell the FBI, that's, that would be a crime in itself if he could see the future and didn't say, hey, all these people are going to die. So, I mean, any way you slice it, their story just doesn't add up. Right. And what we also know is that the, the, the interviews, audio, video that were allegedly given by Osama after – uh, December 15th of 2001 are, are fake. So, I mean, there's an obvious explanation. You got to fake him because the guy's no longer alive. Because yeah, he had was, Marfan syndrome, so he was, he was dying of kidney uh, 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 Well, you know? yeah. Well, that's one of the reports, yes. Now, even Fox News actually carried a story about Osama's death for, for in yes, February of 2002. You are correct. But David Ray Griffin has published a whole book about it, which is Os Osama bin Laden dead or alive. And when the, he, some of your listeners may know that when, uh, when Ed Haas of the Muckraker Report noticed that a wanted poster for Osama said nothing about 9-11, he contacted the FBI and he spoke to, to Rex Toom, T-O-M-B, who told him that the reason that there was nothing about 9-11 for Osama's wanted poster is because the FBI had no hard evidence that Osama bin Laden had anything to do with it. Yeah, isn't that lovely, Jim? They have no hard evidence, yet we just quote-unquote assassinated him so now we're coming if you believe the official story we're committing murder based on lies all right guys we're going to break we'll be right back stay tuned we gotta go pay some bills
Welcome back. It is Wednesday, May 25th, 2011. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. And today I'm joined by my good friend, Jim Fetzer, who I am proud to say is a friend of mine. It's not, that's not just some radio chit-chat. Jim and I actually are friends. So <clears throat> without further ado, uh, since we don't have much time, Jim, go ahead and take the reins. Yeah, thanks, Popeye. The, uh, the bombing that took him out occurred on April 7, 2003. It was at the uh, Al Saha restaurant in the Mansour district of Baghdad. The restaurant was owned by Uday Hussein. And uh, it was because uh, Saddam had these special British-made cell phones, Jaguar phones, that they were able to track him and, and get the GPS on him. And it was a you know, huge mistake that he didn't realize that the phones could be used to target him so that uh, uh, our intelligence sources on the ground confirmed that Saddam and his boys entered the building. General Tommy Franks was monitoring those calls from CENTCOM. Uh, Yvonne's son, Chris Walker, was in flight in his B-1 bomber over Iraq and been asked to drop a, on a weapon station north of Baghdad when he got the urgent call to head back to Baghdad. This is the big one, he was told. Now, he didn't know what the big one meant, but he presumed it was some pretty big target. He would later find out the big one, in fact, was Saddam Hussein. It wasn't the building he was in. It wasn't somebody else. It was he himself. So T Tommy Franks ordered Captain Walker to triple check his coordinates and not to miss. Two minutes out, Walker confirmed with General Franks that the target was still in place, and they were ready to drop, and he was told, don't miss. The bombs were dropped, and immediately upon the bombs hitting the ground, the cell phone conversations in which Saddam was engaged abruptly ended, and the phones went dead. Uh, the, the weapons they used were four joint direct attack munition bombs, JDAMs that were dropped on target. They were told after that to head back to base. When they went back to their base, the crew was met with cheers, and sometime during the night after they'd gone to bed, her son, Chris, was awakened by his commanding officer and summoned quickly to a makeshift telecommunications center with the Pentagon. The Pentagon had, uh, had ordered his, uh, uh, her son and his crew members to do a live feed interview from in theater because, as his commanding officer told him, quote, you got him. You got Saddam and his two boys. So this appears to have been the event that they were going to announce and celebrate aboard the uh, USS Lincoln in San Diego. But when someone, in our best guess is it was Donald Rumsfeld, uh, realized that assassinating the leader of a foreign nation had been prohibited by executive orders signed by three presidents, they realized that if Bush was uh, to go on the, the Lincoln and announce that... Uh, they had killed Saddam, it would have created quite a, a situation since that would have been a, an illegal act. Now, you made the point about killing Osama if, if, if they actually had killed him in this staged raid, the way they described, it was an act of murder. I mean, you know, there's no due process. As you observe, the FBI had, has said it has no hard evidence connecting uh, Osama to 9-11, and yet the American people were euphoric. People were actually, you know, dancing in the street, being thrilled, huge crowds gathering around the White House to celebrate. Yeah, like idiots. Barack Obama. And there are a lot of political commentators, Popeye, who think that Barack has thereby s cemented his reelection. I think you're going to find there are very few Republicans that are going to want to go up against this guy because now he's a war hero, see? Now, remember just what happened just before this thing with uh, Osama took place. Uh, Barack was under a lot of heat about his birth certificate. He'd just come out four square behind what appears to be a, a fake birth certificate. There was a lot of complaints about him not having close Guantanamo, about American forces being in Pakistan, about the use of these predator bombers. So they spin this story where the original source of information is supposed to have come out of Guantanamo. So obviously Guantanamo is a big plus. And of course the attack is taking place in Pakistan, so obviously having troops in Pakistan is a big plus. 
And since he's now got uh, Osama, who cares where Barack was born, right? This now is, becomes a, a, a very big deal. Now, the fact of the matter is, before I had uh, encountered Yvonne, who turned out to be extremely good at putting research together, so practically everything other than the transcripts from our interviews and so forth that you'll find under the heading of the Mission Accomplished Fiasco at 911scholars.org is information she put together. But I mean, it's, you know, it's links to public articles and all that, including one where Dick Cheney is quoted as saying that he believed he was dead and that his lifeless body had been dragged out of the rubble. Now, I'd been very curious about this whole business with Saddam since uh, an Australian journalist named Joe v v Viles had suggested that the guy in custody, remember, was supposed to have been found in this spider hole, which is frankly quite absurd because Saddam Hussein was a very dignified man and he wouldn't have crawled into a hole to try to escape being captured like that. But it was one of his doubles. Now, Saddam had quite a few. What, what, what Joe noticed was that the teeth were wrong. Saddam had immaculate teeth and the bite was wrong. And I decided to verify what he had to say by getting in a, a photograph of Saddam from an unimpeachable source. And you may or may not remember, but the CENTCOM had these decks of cards with all the highest ranking. Uh, yes, I actually still have mine from when I was in the military. Okay, well, he ace of spades with Saddam, and he has these wonderful teeth. And the bite is completely different than the... Than the than yeah, the, that guy had gnarly teeth, and Saddam yeah. Hussein looked like he had the Ken doll teeth. He had them porcelain right. veneer-looking teeth. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, Chris would receive a huge amount of accolades. He was, uh, he was featured on CNN broadcast worldwide. Uh, eventually, when he came back to California, he'd be defeated at the Crystal Cathedral, this very, very famous uh, church. It, it televises all of its services. And he was, he was featured there to give him praise for having taken out Saddam Hussein. So that you can find on this website I mentioned, you know, go to 9-11 Scholars and scroll down to Mission Accomplished Fiasco. You're going to find at least a dozen different sources that contribute information to this. In fact, it turns out that when the Red Cross finally put enough pressure uh, on uh, the American authorities to allow Saddam's wife to visit him in custody in Iraq before his trial, she came out crying, where is my husband? What have you done with my husband? This man is not my husband. And of course it wasn't, he was one of the doubles. So the whole thing with the trial and all that was a charade. And what I'm saying is this charade, remarkably enough, is an even bigger charade than that uh, involved with uh, killing Osama bin Laden after the man has already been dead. I remember so, uh, his wife saying that that wasn't Saddam. Yeah, I remember right. him, her coming out and saying, that's not my husband. What have you done with my yeah. husband? And they dragged her away. That's and right. the officials locked her up for a little while. And God knows whatever they said to her. But, uh, you know, I rem and they were making, of course, the news media, oh, she's insane. She's hysterical. Right, she's right, just upset. Right, right. But she kept saying, that's not my husband. That's one that's of right. his doubles. That's right. I actually published an article around this entitled, When is Saddam not Saddam? in which I was talking about all the evidence that suggested that it was a double that they had in custody, and it wasn't actually Saddam Hussein. And this is before I had encounters with, uh, with Yvonne Wachter, who, as I say, is a completely brilliant uh, researcher, so that we have here a story that is one of the biggest stories of the entire war, namely that Saddam Hussein was actually taken out just three weeks into the Iraqi invasion, and the people were misled. They weren't told the truth, just as in the case of Osama dying on uh, uh, 15 December 2001. The people were deceived. They weren't uh, told the truth. So we're dealing with very large-scale psyops. And this thing with uh, Os Osama, uh, when, when I knew that Osama had died so long before, and to me it was just stunning to see the dimensions of the public relations operation, the PSYOP that was taking place there. Even regular programs were being inter interrupted to announce that, that uh, Barack Obama was gonna say something about, uh, about uh, taking out Osama and all that. I mean, it was, a, it was incredible. If you knew the truth, you were just stupefied, okay? 
Now they had, they, they convened a, cer a ceremony, a military ceremony. Uh, hang on to that thought, Jim. We'll pick up when we come back on the other side of this break. Uh, Guys, stay tuned. You don't want to miss the last segment of the show tonight. Micro 1650 AM, the Orion Talk Radio Network. Befriending me, he was only using me to be friends with the enemy. A presidential terrorist, ain't that a contradiction? I guess it goes to show the truth, it's stranger than fiction. But they don't even show the truth when soldiers are missing. I'm only to the enemy. Words have power, but actions speak loud and pretend to be free. Till you die a slave, a soldier in the desert, searching for a ghost in the cave for the corporation. I run out of patience, sick of seeing troops sent to die for your lives. Spending dollars and death, we holler in protest till we have your arrest. We will not rest and we know we know we know what you did that day killed your own citizens to advance your ways all my real patriots stand up and say 9 11 was an inside job right jim no doubt about it go on before the break uh you were talking about how they were uh they had this big ceremony and that's right on on, on the air about base the first right yeah, this is the the, the air base where uh, Chris's uh, plane and crew were based, where uh, General T. Michael Mosley awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross to the crew members of his B-1 bomber, which they called Swede 72, for successfully executing their mission on April 7, 2003, and the accompanying certificate lauded them for completely destroying one of the principal targets of the campaign. And, of course, that target was, in fact, uh, Saddam Hussein. And as, as Yvonne has pointed out, you can go online and do research, but you'll find uh, White House Chief of Staff Andy Card was telling an online audience in, from Waco, Texas, I believe he, meaning Saddam, is dead. General Frank said they had DNA, positive DNA on Saddam, good DNA on Saddam, and they were undergoing forensic tests. Well, they're undergoing forensic tests. Obviously, that would support what Vice President Cheney had said, namely that his lifeless body had been pulled out of the rubble and he believed he was dead. So you got all these things going on. Within 21 days of our intervention, the basic mission was accomplished, not just Saddam, but his two sons and about 60 members of the general staff. And they had this event, this mission accomplished event on May 1st, 2003, off of the coast of San Diego. And they, they, they made the mistake by keeping the mission accomplished banner up because, I mean, the mission that was accomplished was taking out Saddam. And the fact of the matter is that it all got botched because they weren't able to uh, announce it because uh, we believe it was Rumsfeld had figured out that if, in fact, they announced it, then they'd be implying that Bush had violated three executive orders and thereby committed a crime. So the whole thing got mucked up. And as you said, you know, the whole the whole business with mission accomplished or not to be a bit of a, 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 a farce. He did not announce Saddam was dead, uh, even though Dick Cheney would say that on May 7th, one month after Chris Walker had taken him out. And then you got all these twists and turns where they they decide they need Saddam around. They actually find one of his doubles and he had quite a few. And this is the guy they pull out of the spider hole. This is the guy they put on trial. This is the guy who Saddam's wife visited and came out yelling, this is not my husband. This is not my husband. What have you done with my husband? So it's really fascinating. I, I, I tend to believe, uh, Popeye, that you know the further you go in Washington, uh, the better the liar. The better the liar, the further you go. And that so much of what we're told by our government is just false. I mean, it's, it's made up. It's just phony. And they, they have all kinds of political reasons for manipulating it. So I say if anyone wants to, you know, get the skinny on Saddam, go to 911scholars.org, scroll down to the Mission Accomplished fiasco and start taking a look. You'll find a couple of transcripts of interviews I did with the uh, first one that I did with Yvonne on uh, the 11th of April, 2007. Then there's another that she and I did together with Maria Heller on the Maria show on the 3rd of September. And then on the 12th of September, I had her back again on my show. And then you'll find all these supporting documents. And one of the great ones is the uh, featuring of him on the uh, 
on the uh, Crystal Palace, the Hour of Power. You have two videos there where you can see him being lauded in this huge, huge uh, church that is, uh, you know, like an icon to the religious right and fundamentalist Christians, a Christian, the Crystal Cathedral. I, I mean, you know, and this is already happening on the 25th of May, 2003. So it's only about six weeks after he's actually taken out Saddam that he's being honored there. And there's a whole lot of really good stuff here. I, I just was astonished by how good Yvonne was at conducting research, Popeye. And so if somebody wants to know, if you want to know the inside story and how this whole thing about the trial and all that was completely faked using one of Saddam's doubles, go here and get the inside story of what actually happened. And if you remember during the trial, Jim, they actually, uh, well, I, and I'm doing air quotes, Saddam was not there for over 75% of it because they kept saying he was making outbursts, so they had to, you know, they had to uh, drag him out. And they, they, one of the things that they said he kept saying was that this is a farce, this whole trial is fake. This is an illegitimate trial, blah, blah, blah. Now, then they would follow it up with he would say, I am still the president of Iraq and all this other stuff, which obviously is knowing the major American networks. That's CIA type <laughs> propaganda. Yeah. But knowing that he was seeing his outbursts and knowing that none of us speak his his native tongue, they could say whatever and people believe it. It's the same crap with the bin Laden tapes. Yeah. But I'm willing to bet he was screaming, I'm not Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Well, I'll just tell you, he wasn't Saddam. It was one of his doubles. My opinion is he may have been uh, given a deal, you know, that if you, if you play along and, 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 and fake it, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time as one of his doubles, then we'll see that after a mock hanging, we'll give you a secret identity and send you off somewhere where you can live out the rest of your life in, in comfort. It may be that, however, even if they made that arrangement with him, that they actually did hang him because it was too dangerous to have him around. You know, if you got this guy who looks just like Saddam Hussein, or at least looks just like the guy who was put on trial, and he turns up somewhere in the world, that's going to be a big story. And what amazes me, Popeye, is that Yvonne and I haven't been coy about this story. I've had her several times on it, and, uh, you know, even going on Maria Heller's show, she has a huge audience. And yet I, I know of no reporters actually followed up on this. I mean, he... This is the kind of story that could win a reporter a, a, a Pulitzer Prize, frankly. Well, and look at Ventura's show. Ventura's show is national, you know, and actually international because I know True TV is in other countries, you know. I know they see American television. Yeah. But we'll say just, j just for argument's sake, we'll just say just for national. And I, it's a national cable show. So millions of people sh saw the JFK episode where yeah. you see E. Howard Hunt's son, St. John Hunt, admit uh, and play the tapes of his father admitting that he took part in the John F. Kennedy assassination. So therefore, therefore the, Ken the Kennedy assassination was a conspiracy. But sure, of course. did any of the major news media pick that up? No, they completely ignored it. You know why? Because if they had aired it, it would verify that it was a conspiracy because a conspiracy means two or more people getting together to do something bad. And they, that shatters the whole paradigm of their lone gunman, you know, three, you know, three shots from the book, school book depository from behind. It destroys their whole story, so they'll never let you know. But it just goes to show you it's the same thing. It's a yeah. huge story, and no one picks up on it. Yeah, it's a huge story, and no one picks up on it. Actually... I've suggested to Jesse that he might want to run this story, but uh, the, the decision-making process is complicated. They submit multiple proposals. Uh, they might submit 20 proposals to the, to, the, to the channel, you know, to the company, and, and they pick eight or ten, whatever. So, you know, it's not that they can pick exactly what they want to cover. But it's certainly a story of the magnitude that I've recommended it to him, and I would be uh, simply delighted if he were, in fact, to... Uh, follow up on it but th for that we're going to have to wait and see well, let's hope let's hope he even as he's able to have a third season you know because he's not uh well it's a hugely pop it's by yeah. far the the most uh, the biggest draw on true tv oh i would without a doubt yeah. it's, i mean his show and i got to give him credit for having the cojones to at least talk about this stuff yeah. 
you know, a lot of people make fun of him and attack him. Like <clears throat> he yeah. talked about Dr. Judy Wood. And all yeah. she said was check out her work. Okay? Yeah. And people attacked yeah. him. Oh, he's nuts. And look, yes, Judy yeah. Wood, my personal opinion is this is not Jim Fetzer's opinion. This is Popeye's opinion. Judy Wood's out of her mind. Okay, and I only say that because I've listened to interviews that uh, my fellow uh, hosts here on this network have done and other hosts that are my friends have done. And she's just, she doesn't, you know, even the stuff we talk about is a theory. The government's own theory of how 9-11 happened is just that. It's a theory. It's not actual fact. So until we can scientifically prove by seeing the evidence and then matching it up to this, you know, the assassination science, as yeah. it were, you can't really you can't you, nothing is 100 percent verified. Everything is a theory. So when Judy answers a question because <laughs> she said it on multiple talk shows, she, you ask her about her. You, if you say, well, your theory of direct energy weapons, she gets pissed and says it's not a theory. Now, look. You, you can't do that. You can't say that you know a hundred because you, you know what when you when you ask her the follow up question of well where's the evidence for you to say it she goes it's in my book, but you, when you ask her a question about stuff like even Hurricane Aaron I've discussed this with you it, yeah. there's never a solid answer about it and like I yeah. said my view on it was the storm was going to get in the way of nine eleven so they used yeah. harp to create a high pressure dome and bounce it yeah. out of the way. That's and I, you know, that's, that comes that's, from that's very interesting, Popeye. I'll just say that Judy is the one who did the most to gather together all the evidence about the effects of the destruction of the World Trade Center that have to be explained. For that, she yes. deserves enormous yes. credit. Yes, yes, you are right. There is, she has documented so much evidence to show that there is so much hinky stuff going on there. You know, you're right, Jim. Oh. I'll just say, Popeye, it's a real pleasure to be on with you. I think you got a great show, and I'm, I, I really enjoy it. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to you know stand side by side and fight the new world order with you. Guys, this is the end of the show. Thank you for listening to Down the Rabbit Hole. Tune in again Friday and Sunday here on Uriah Talk Radio Network, Micro 1650 AM.